the species. So the fragmented habitat is a fragmentation of the habitat is one of the problems associated with the patch size. Initially, uh, consisting of only one habitat type, like the forest, fragmentation is a process that happens along the continuum. So if we can see the forest matrix, the gap formation, this is the fragment fragmentation, if you can see, is result to the what we call the agricultural matrix. From this perspective of the forest matrix, from two goes to the agricultural matrix. So it creates the what we call the isolated patches. And there is already a what we call a gap formation among these uh, patches. So the fragmentation consists of two parts. Number one is a, re a reduction in the amount of habitat site and also the less connectivity among those habitat regions due to the gap formation. Consider the scenario where there was once only a forest land, this one, and the three farmers later moved in and began farming their respective parcels. It started by three, by three farmers. And with time, the farms extend their agricultural operations, bringing about wider gaps between the habitat patches as the development seeps in. And the area is currently uh, transitioning from a forest matrix to what we call agricult agricultural matrix. Although it is narrow initially, there is still a, a communication between the forest section. There is still a connection. There is a completely new kind of habitat that was formed at the end of the continuum. Many of the original species would have two possibilities from the perspective of wildlife. They could relocate or they could die. That is the sad uh, reality of uh, especially for the these are common nowadays that the forested lands due to the economic demand are being converted to agricultural uh, purpose and in that cases there are species that are being affected so these are common even here in our, in, in here in our country the Philippines currently a matrix of agricultural landscape frequently include areas of woodland wildlife habitat so wildlife management at the landscape scale involves attempting to connect the isolated habitats via the use of corridors particularly the riparian forests or the fence road habitats so in order to promote the native bi biodiversity along the full spectrum of environmental regions or between ecosystems so if we look at it from a different uh, angle and perspective, we don't necessarily need to connect the habitat pieces. Uh, habitat pieces. Instead, we could uh, focus on managing our resources so that wildlife can move about naturally. So the animals can travel on land more easily than across water. But fragmentation in terrestrial systems produces a phenomenon that is close enough to the island effect that predictions based on the what uh, we discussed the island biographic principles can be made so the density of the landscape affects how quickly the organisms can move across it as a result a lot of patches with uh, resemble a lot of stepping stones that organisms might use as cover as they move from one patch to another. Okay, so a fragmented habitat. So we have an illustration six. 
So this one, it indicates here that it matters how fragmentation happens. If you uh, split along line one, population or the community A will eventually go extinct. And the population A does go to extinct if you split along line two. So when, when, as already mentioned, a patch grows in size, so does the numbers of species that live there. So these patches, however, are neither a representative sample nor a segment of the landscape. Um, generally speaking, when you divide, uh, when you divide of one specific sort of habitat by fragmenting the habitat. So if you're going to fragment the habitat patch, you should consider the habitat types that are present in both the patch and the matrix and make an effort to preserve each type patch. So the fragmentation of habitat in the landscape can be considered as either a good or bad thing. As Leopold noted, it can increase edge, which benefits the generalist wildlife uh, species like the white-tailed deer, their food, also northern uh, bobwhite, or by juxtaposing habitats in a way that is advantageous to edge. So the fragmentation may be considered harmful if habitat is being lost or a smaller habitat patches are developed which results in isolation or local extinction. Ecosystems are no longer connected, especially in the fragmentation is brought on by an activity other than forestry such as urbanization. So how can they created a gap already? So especially with urbanization because animals will have a difficulty to to move freely. So if you watch some of the wildlife uh, document, documentation, I've seen one, uh, I think that is, that is in Australia, where some of the deers have a hard time to cross the, the road. Because it is, the road is a what we call uh, traffic road. So there are there are times that these animals are being hit by the car. So because their natural habitat has been uh, divided by this road and it creates a fragment. So ecosystems are no longer connected, especially in the fragmentation. So it's brought by this, uh, uh, brought by humans through the urbanization. And because fragmented habitat is hazardous to inferior species like uh, voodoo links, for example, and wood uh, crashes, the, quant the quantity of edge has grown. Okay, so next is the non-native species and the fragmentation. One other unfavorable consequences of habitat fragmentation is the introduction of a non-native or exotic species. According to the recent estimates in the United States, the exotic flora is make, uh, makes up more than 25% of the total. So there is a long history of deliberate and unintentional introduction of exotic plants and animals. And as well as their endemics. So, especially non-native species here in the Philippines, um, as far as I can recall, like uh, uh, the genital fish uh, invaded some of the rivers in the Philippines. That uh, because this uh, genital fish is not really uh, conducive for human consumption, it is useless. While at the same time, the, the habitat for the species that are more conducive for uh, consumption by humans are being affected and their, their reproduction, the 
pro the production of this uh, more desirable species are damaged. So that is an example of it creates a uh, problem for the humans, for us. So the whole ecosystems have been transformed and are still being transformed by this alien species, particularly those introduced by humans into environments they would not have reached through the normal dispersion, uh, dispersal method. It is uh, in the uh, influence by mankind. For instance, in the Eastern uh, uh, deciduous forest in the America, uh, the chestnut once made up to 25% of the volume of stamp, uh, standing timber. These days, all that remain of the species are few to escape the invasive chestnut type and what we call this as sprouts. So the composition structure and the operations of these ecosystems have all been significantly altered as a consequence of this invasion by an alien species. So the exotic species also have other negative effects on the ecosystem structure or composition. A species is kept in check in native ecosystem by the ecosystem control mechanism, such as the competition for food, habitat, or water, uh, disease causing uh, diseases, as well as the predators. Those uh, same regulating mechanis mechanisms are frequently uh, absent when a new species is introduced into an environment. So that alters the natural uh, way of the ecosystem. Its population typically grows explosively without any natural strengths because probably this uh, new species, this uh, uh, exotic species, as or have no predators because they are the more dominant species in this area. So that in that the manner they reproduce their population well, uh, as in my previous lesson uh, it calls the explosive growth. So the exotics and closely related native species have been grown to hybridize and which reduce the genetic fitness of the native population and because the new native prey have not evolved with time to deal with this new predator introduced predators may result in a decline in a native prey species so as an example earlier the philippine fish invasion of the uh, sucker moth fish was spilled out in the aquarium trade to the local rivers and this is known as like, the janitor fish. So, no natural predator and rapid breeder, they reproduce uh, uh, very fast and competes with other species for food. And in that case, our more desirable fish will have the difficulty to, to, to grow and also to produce. And this species, the, the genital fish, eats the eggs of other fish. And this fish can cause an erosion to the river banks. And uh, also, the species threatened to the carp, the fish, and the mudfish and tilapia, which are more, uh, more desirable for us. Okay, so additionally, introduced species uh, illness that native species are not prepared to fight to an ecosystem and last but not least an introduced species may have a negative impact on how human population functions by upsetting the operations uh, hastening the deterioration of the valuable food and in the case of this uh, genital fish and recreational resources or degrading of the water quality. Okay, next is the corridors. So the corridor, the strip of land that uh, deviates from the matrix on other side 
is the final element of the landscape. So the areas that connect patches uh, together are known as corridors, which act as a thoroughfare uh, or channel for the species to travel between patches. So these corridors are a special uh, assemblage of biotic and environmental characteristics from the surrounding matrix and patches. So the similar to patches, they include origins and characteristics uh, such as the disturbance, the remnant, environmental resource, and planted corridors. So there are also stream corridors such as the river or stream uh, that stretches of vegetation that line streams and so crucial to migrating wildlife. So in addition to acting as a conduit for movement, the corridors can also act as a filter or barrier, which may uh, restrict the flow of genes. And for instance, the roadways can act as a nearly uh, impenetrable barrier to the movement of the amphibians, ultimately isolating a colony. So what are the structure and the purpose of these corridors. So the degree of the or bilinearity uh, breaks, narrows, nodes, and connection are only a few of the variables that affect the structure and functions of these corridors. So the curvature of the corridor or its uh, or bilinearity has implication for how the edge functions. So the edge is increased by increased corvillinearity. So where the matrix divides a continuous corridor, it breaks pure. So for certain species, especially plant species, they might not, they might not have an impact or mobility because they are stationary. But for others, they might block they might block the flow of species, the genes, and energy through that system. So some species can pass through the restricted area due to narrow that are created when some of the corridors get smaller. According to the studies from England, nodes are the intersection of corridors where a variety of interior species can occasionally be found. And maintaining the corridor uh, the connectivity, it's also keeping them uninterrupted and connected. So some of the concerns in corridors. So the downsides of corridor are also present. They influence predators to change how they search, which uh, also increase the predation on local wildlife species. So the predation is more uh, likely to reduce the number of uh, small animals that use a passage as a corridor for movement. So think about how the eastern diamond black rattlesnake like to bask in the sun near to a hiking trail. So consider the people who walk on that road as well. So every rattlesnake the people came across would likely be destroyed which would eventually result in uh, fewer rattlesnake because they are the cause, they can cause harm and worst case scenario can lead to a death of someone. So the natural inclination is to neutralize that, uh, that threat. Another problem is that some corridors like roadways or rail road right away might serve as a pathway for the spread of virus and disease. So in our seventh illustration, it is necessary for these corridors to be wide enough to benefit the wildlife uh, more. So this constrained uh, riparian corridor likely has a greater detrimental effect on wildlife. So the lesson is clear. The broader these pathways are, 
the less likely it is that the predators will be scolded their prey. For some larger species like the black bears, these wide uh, strips like, uh, may need to be several miles across. While for lesser species, they may only need to be a few yards wide. And uh, the internal properties of the environment change after the corridor is 100 yards wide and the nest predation uh, drastically increased after that, based on the uh, scientific study. So next is the change in the landscape. So even though uh, we frequently manage land with the assumption that it will always be in some fixed community uh, landscape change, but we may all agree that natural uh, communities are living and also evolving things. For instance, when a tree falls, the landscape matrix is disrupted. Eventually, this gap will close and reintegrate into the matrix. So, when making changes, it is important to take into account how they will affect the landscape in totality, not just uh, now, but also in long term, like 50 to 100 years. And for instance, if you clear cut 10 to 100 acres at five year intervals, all those clear cuts and the subsequent forests will reach the pole stage. So the pole stage is the little trees as the size of the poles. And at once, over the following 20 to 30 years, the, the pole stage is the least favorable from the uh, perspective of biological diversity proportion or promotion. Therefore, it is imperative to foresee the long-term impact of management recommendations. Okay, so next is the dynamic uh, metapopulation. So finally, uh, metapopulation is a component of landscape ecology that the ecologists have only uh, recently studied. So a network of what we call the relatively isolated populations with uh, some degree of the growing or sporadic emigration and the gene flow is referred as the metapopulation. So it is a, a population of populations, to put it simple. Individuals uh, or individual populations may become extinct in the metapopulation dynamics. And although they may later become colonized, by the other populations. So serious genetic issues for preserving the species may arise if we force this particular population down to low enough numbers without allowing for the population migration. So that would lead to extinction. And the genetic environment will remain largely constant even with minor population mobility. So the sink and source patches. So depending on whether uh, such populations show a source or sink patch of a meta population, they will likely go extinct if there is no migration. All source of patches will always remain in the same area and will provide people to every other patch in the landscape. And because these sink patches uh, lack a suitable habitat for the species to exist, they allow the populations or individuals to go extinct. With territorial wildlife the species, for instance, it is common for the source piece of habitat for population to be full or at a carrying, at carrying capacity. So here in the illustration 8, a population of source and sink population. So depending on whether such population shows a source or the sink patch of the meta population, they will likely to go extinct. If there is no migration, they will not uh, spread. All source patches 
will always remain in the same area and provide people to every uh, other patch in, in the landscape. Because the sink patches lack a suitable habitat for the species to exist, they allow the population or individuals to go extinct. And with the territorial wildlife, uh, for instance, it's common for the species to uh, yeah, well, populations to be full or their carrying capacity. So another benefit of the sink population is that it can help to uh, repopulate a sink patch if a catastrophic event will wipes out all of these inhabitants in one patch and therefore uh, they hope uh, over the time the sink patches aid in population stabilization so if you can see here uh, the source they spread out and they created a sink from the source they spread Therefore, um, uh, it occurs that one patch may not occur simultaneously with another patches, and due to the relative isolation and protection of the source and sink regions, the meta population also have the essential uh, property of occasionally acting as a buffer against the extinct extinction of the species. For instance, even though there is a connectivity between the patches, the illness cannot spread to all the population if it eliminates all the people in one patch. So as a result, the management of wildlife today um, relies on the idea of the meta population. So the suitable management, so these outcomes may indicate that a regional uh, extinctions of species and less recolonization and spread of habitat patches and species that are foreign or non-native encroaching and increase a avian predation or nest parasitism and decline in the variety of wildlife species that is found in the interior of the US. So for our references and recommended readings you may uh, uh, download this uh, book, The Landscape Ecology and Ecosystem Management by Thomas G. Barnes. He is one of the extension uh, wildlife specialists. So the link is uh, can be found here. So despite the complexity and difficulty of landscape ecology and metapopulation dynamics for the general public, we must uh, make an attempt to comprehend these ideas because they are crucial for the um, making decisions on landscape level and the animal management. And for those, and for those of us in the real estate service sector, a thorough understanding of the subject will give us a, broad, a broader perspective and guide our decision making with regard to our most valuable asset which is the whole uh, area of that okay so this is the end of my lecture so thank you very much to be part and uh, i'll see you again on my next lesson